Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cornerstone class again this morning. Uh, we are in Revelations chapter 3, the last part of chapter 3. And uh, this is the last of the seven churches that we're going to look at, the message to the Laodicean church, uh, verses 14 through 22. And uh, this is going to be kind of vital uh, as we look at this church. And uh, we can't say that this time is, uh, you know, this is the uh, best of the, of the last because uh, uh, this is not the best of the last, this church here. So uh, we're going to take a look at this. Laodicea uh, was about 100 miles due east of Ephesus. And uh, it was a, a uh, city that was wealthy, had a big banking center. It had a, a u unique breed of black sheep so that they were uh, able to flourish with a cloth clothing industry. And then also uh, a medical uh, center with physicians basically specializing in uh, the treatment of eye disease. So uh, these were the three main characteristics of uh, the city, uh, the banks, clothing industry, and the doctors there. It sounds kind of familiar to a lot of our big cities today. You know, think about New York and D.C. and those areas like that. But keep in, keep in mind these things uh, as we study because they will give us insights into the uh, language our Lord used to this church. Those three things there, we're going to get to them here. And as I said, it was about 100 miles due east Ephesus. There were also uh, two other cities located very near uh, to one another with Laodicea. Colossae was one and Hierapolis was another. And uh, Paul uh, mentioned uh, this city four times in Colossians. He mentioned Laodicea four times in Colossians. And in 416 of Colossians, uh, he wanted uh, specific instructions given that uh, that letter there would be read also in Laodicea. And there was also a letter to Laodicea that was to be read in Colossae. So these two churches share, share basically the same spiritual, spiritual atmosphere. So what we're going to see here this morning is uh, verses 14 through 16, a lukewarm church. A lukewarm church. And all the messages, the way Jesus introduces himself, is significant, as, as we've already seen in many of them. See, this was the way Jesus wanted the church to see him. This is how he wanted this church really to see him as well. Jesus used a remarkable reference to himself as the amen that we see here. He says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the amen. So, we use this familiar word to express our agreement with a statement or action. A lot of times when we end prayer also, we, we, we close in prayer with amen. Jesus used this word frequently. As you, as you study scriptures, he used it frequently. This is the word also translated verily. In other words, it, it indicates that what is said is extremely important and trustworthy. And naturally, if Jesus used it a lot, it meant to pay attention. Listen to what's going to be said because it's truth. So... It is used to identify significant truth for us. It is a kind of formula for focused attention that Jesus used to underscore and emphasize what he was doing. So Jesus was saying here that he is the final word of truth and that anyone who goes beyond his teaching is not presenting new information. Instead, he is departing from the truth. In other words, like if, if you add something to Scripture that's not there, it, it's your own thought-up idea, you're going against what he has said. And we already know the Word of God is truth. So Jesus is the faithful and true witness here as well, as he goes on and says, the, the faithful and true witness in verse 14. He not only tells the truth, he is the truth. And Jesus has no secret agenda and no hidden plan for anybody. Or anything. He tells his churches the whole truth and he wants us to know that he does so. 
And that's what he's telling this church here, Laodicea. He's letting them know where they stand with his church. And remember, all seven of these churches are his churches. And the third phrase here that we see, the beginning of the creation of God, carries the same idea of thought in John 1.3. See, this is where John tells us, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he, 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 he has made all things. Okay? So Jesus is not only the source of the physical world we have now, he is also the beginning of the new creation that has already begun in the hearts of those who trust him as their Savior. 2 Corinthians 5.17. You know, we become new creatures. Okay? All, uh, and all things uh, become new. Old things pass away. We're to become like him. And the church in Laodicea specifically needed to be reminded of this truth. And he, he, he lets them know that here. See, this church needed to know that Jesus is truth and he is the whole truth. This church had been misled into believing that the present physical world was more important than the spiritual world that is to come. That's what they were about. They were getting comfortable in their position in this church and of this church. They were, being, they were complacent in what they were doing. And over the years, many churches have fallen into this trap and have been ensnared in the deceit of circumstances. You know, when you think you're doing things good and great and everything's going fine, you don't need any help. And this is what he's going to uh, show them here. And one more time, we learn that Jesus knows us as we really are. That's what he, he's going to show them here later on. The church in Laodicea did not think of itself the same way Jesus did, as we're going to see here. This church regarded itself as healthy, prosperous, but it was suffering from what someone has called the leukemia of non-commitment. It's, like, it's, it's like two people dating, if you look at it that way, and one or the other doesn't want to commit to the relationship to go to the next level, the next step. Engagement, marriage, whatever it may be. Non-committed. See, they had a self-image that was pleasing to them, but it was wrong. And that's how we are at times, as individuals. And as, as we know, all, all churches are made up of individuals, so keep that thought in mind as well. Remember the church in Sardis thought it was alive, but we saw it was really dead. And here was a church that was neither hot nor cold, as he says here. Jesus plainly said that this was a lukewarm church there. I know thy works, he says in verse 15, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So he, he, he lets them know, listen, you're not cold nor hot. In other words, you're straddling the fence on issues, on your beliefs, on how, how you've accomplished things in this world, this life. That's where he, where he states it to them. Verse 16 goes on and says, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. See, there were no challenges in Laodicea. Many men probably found, found this church as being pleasant. Well, naturally, they would find it being pleasant because they were able to do what they wanted to do in and of themselves, not relying on anything else. So they found no challenges in this church. There were no problems in the church that demanded attention, according to the people here. There were you know, no immediate appeals for funds or for workers because they had it all, and they thought they had it all. And that was all on the surface. Everything appeared to be going along very well there in Laodicea with the individuals there at this church. However, Jesus saw things quite differently. At verse 16, you know, Jesus clearly stated that he, he wanted this church to be either hot or cold. And I mean, he was going to spew them. That, he, he was going to vomit them out of his mouth. They were lukewarm. And as such, they were unpleasant to Jesus. And he's, he's letting them know this right here and now. The terms used in verse 16 actually suggest that. Nausea that produces vomit. See, and that is a striking and startling picture that Jesus gives his church here. 
See, whatever the church in Laodicea had, they thought that they had enough, as we're going to see here in a bit. They considered themselves to be rich, blessed, increased with goods, and in need of nothing, as we're going to see. There is a great spiritual danger in equating physical cir circumstances with spiritual blessings. We know God can bless us physically in many ways. But we must not substitute physical prosperity for spiritual well-being. See, we do not know the exact conditions here in this church, what they were doing for him to say one way or the other if they were hot or cold, but he knew that they were lukewarm. But we do know their attitude toward the conditions because he has presented it to us right here that they were lukewarm. They weren't doing things to the best of their abilities, for God, they were doing things in and of themselves. See, they were complacent and satisfied with the situation of the church. And no matter what their actual circumstances were, their attitude was all wrong about it. See, we can do a lot of things in this world that, that help people, but if you're doing it in the wrong attitude, that's not pleasing to God. So that's the first thing we see here in this church. They were lukewarm. In other words, they weren't on fire spiritually for the Lord Jesus Christ. Second thing we see here, verses 17 through 19, wise counsel. Christ always gives his churches this counsel, what they can do to improve, to get back to what they once were. See, in the eyes of Jesus, this was a wretched, miserable, poor blind and naked church. He says in verse 17, because thou sayest, do you get that? Because thou sayest, because what they have said, that they are rich, as we just mentioned, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. See, they, they were satisfied with what they had. They were complacent. They didn't need to do any more than what they were doing in order to get, gain more people to come into the church because people are satisfied in and of themselves with what they get to accomplish. But this is very different from the image this church had of itself, as, we, as I just mentioned. Jesus said they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Wretched is a translation of a word that pertains to a state of mental or physical misery. Uh, Webster said uh, pitiful, contemptible, worthless. Miserable denotes either a situation or someone who deserves sympathy because of a pathetic or pitiful condition. And then poor here in John's language refers to an economic state of destitution, a beggarly state. So he says here to them, that's what they were. They couldn't see it in and of themselves. See, a good self-image can easily conceal a wretched soul. When you think everything's going fine and well and, and not, no problems, no, no, you don't need any help from anybody, you're financially, physically uh, doing well, you, you don't seek help from any place else. See, we must take care to avoid this deadly error in our thinking. Our attitude needs to be right, especially as believers. You've got to remember, this is one of the Lord's churches here. See, a church gets in this condition when it begins to think that the church exists for the benefit of its members. It, it becomes a, a, a spiritual sh social club is what it becomes. Just like your, your club membership, whatever it may be. When we think that we own our church and that its main purpose is to meet our needs, then a church becomes a kind of, as I said, spiritual social club. See, Every true church belongs exclusively to Jesus Christ. Once again, this was one of his churches here. A church exists to give honor and glory to Christ, not to please its membership. This is what the church in Laodicea forgot. It was all about them. Maybe the growth this church was seeing was because of they felt everything that they were doing was drawing people in. They weren't relying on, on God to do that. And what a sad, important difference 
we have here between thou sayest and thou art. See, many of us, even in, in churches, many believers, have that same type of attitude. We, we can't see deep within us the wrong because we've already made up our minds, our minds, that it's right and that we're okay by doing what it is, whatever we're doing. See, the churches of Jesus are to be light and salt, as we know. Matthew 5, 13 and 16, we're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Churches are charged to understand the program of God and preach and teach that program to all men everywhere. We got the Great Commission. See, churches are to concentrate on what God is doing, not on what men plan to do. You see, their job is to declare the good news that the Savior has come to save us from our sins. When what they were doing was exposed, the church in Laodicea was revealed to be naked, poor, wretched, and blind. Naked, poor, wretched, and blind. And then we see here, verse 18, the key thought in the redemption is expressed here in these words. Buy from me. Buy from me, Jesus says. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the same of thy nakedness, shame of thy nakedness, do not appear and anoint thy eyes with thy salve that thou mayest see. Look, the idea is that Jesus has everything his churches need. We, you can't buy salvation. You can't purchase spiritual things. So we, we see here this, this phrase, I counsel thee to buy of me. So how, how does one buy spiritual things here? See, as I said, salvation nor spirituality can be purchased with money. So how were the Laodiceans to buy these things. See, in, in Isaiah 55, 1, he, he gave, the, he, he gave an, uh, an idea there. He gave the truth there as, he, as he's telling the people. Isaiah 55, 1 tells us here that this is salvation through God's grace. He says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's what it says there in Isaiah. This is, this is what they needed. This church needed what Jesus described as gold, white clothing, and I said. These are the three characteristics of this church in Laodicea. Their wealth. Their, their clothing, their physicians with the eye sad. So he's using their three characteristics to show them who he is. They couldn't gain anything with all these, these things that they had and that they, they were doing. They needed to rely by faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He's the only one that has these things. A church can have many things that come from many sources, but what a church really needs can only be attained from Christ. See, the gold tried there in fire is defined for us in 1 Peter 1.7. It's our faith in God, our faith in the Word of God, and our faith in His only Son. When we look to Jesus, our faith is stirred and called into action. When we trust in our own abilities and resources, we're not resting on the ability and resources of Jesus. You're not acting in faith. You're acting on the things that you can accomplish in and of yourself that you think you can. And this was the first need of this church in Laodicea. They needed to know that these things that he's described here, this gold refined in fire, the white raiment, the eyesight, only he can provide that. He can open up your eyes so that you can see your true self if you exercise your faith in allowing him to do that. See, we, we go along our day sometimes thinking that everything's okay, as I said earlier. 
But if we're not trusting in God, we can get just like this church in Laodicea. So they needed white clothing here. Everyone is spiritually naked before God. Adam and Eve. They sin. Every human being has had something they wanted to hide. They were naked when they came into this world. He clothed them. Clothing accomplishes this for us physically, but we also need the white garments that will clothe our souls. See, Isaiah declared in 64, 6 that our own righteousness is like filthy rags. But the righteousness of Christ clothes us in white and makes us whole. White clothing stands for a changed character. You know, when you get saved, it's like he, he, he has taken off your coat and put on his righteousness upon you. That white raiment stands for a changed character. We're going to learn a little bit more later in Revelation 7 about uh, the white clothes, what it indicates. See, this church needs to return to the understanding that the main thing in the church life was their salvation from their sins and the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's what they needed to get back to. They had forgotten that, and they needed to get back to it. The third thing here was their, the eyesight. They needed eyesight. Jesus said that the church there needed spiritual treatment as well. Not just physical treatment. Eyesight is the interaction of the Holy Spirit with our souls. See, when, when the Holy Spirit's dwelling within you as a believer, that allows us to see ourselves as God sees us. If we allow Him to work in our hearts and our minds, we get to choose what it is that we're going to do. But we need to heed to the Holy Spirit speaking to us. See, we see ourselves and our circumstances through the single eye of the flesh. We base a lot of things that we do on the here and now. That's probably what this church was doing. When we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and teach us, we can get an accurate picture of our lives as they really are. Because that's what Jesus is doing to all these churches that we've seen thus far. He's letting them know how they really are. See, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to the will and way of God. He is the Spirit of truth, and He will lead us into all truth. Christ promised that. When He left, He said, I'm going to send a comfort unto to you. See, the church at Laodicea had strayed from the truth, but there was a way back that we're going to see. And that way was clearly spelled out by a loving Lord. Verse 19 there says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. See, Jesus had not rebuked them in anger. He rebuked them in love so that they can grow and learn from the mistakes that they were making. Third thing we see here in verses 20 through 22, a great invitation. My heading in my Bible says, uh, uh, place an attitude of Christ at the end of the church age. And that's kind of, that, that's really important here. Because these last three verses aren't just specifically for the church at Laodicea. It encompasses all these seven churches that he's talked to and us as an New Testament Bible believing church today. So this is the conclusion to this message and, and to the other seven churches as well as ours today. See, we find a very sad picture here in verse 20. It says, Behold, remember, behold, listen up. Pay attention. We've got something important to say. I stand at the door. That eye is Jesus and knock. Look. Jesus is standing outside the door. Many use this verse to depict Jesus standing outside the door of a lost person's heart, knocking, seeking to come in and save the person. But you've got to keep in mind here that, this, that Jesus is addressing this church at Laodicea and making them aware of how they had pushed him out of their fellowship by all their worldly ideas and actions. This church was not in good shape at all. They had forsaken God. They had walked away from God. They appeared think, thinking that they can handle things without the help of Jesus. 
They were relying in and of themselves here. But he says, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and I will sup with him and he with me. Jesus appears here to be pleading with them one person at a time. As he says, if any man hear my voice, that's any individual hears his voice, to allow them back into their lives. Christ wanted them to, to see who he was, what he was trying to tell them, and repent, as he said back in verse 19, repent zealously therefore, and repent, turn back to me. He wanted them back, he, he wanted to be back in their lives and he wanted them to see that they needed him more than all these other things that they had. Jesus has a great desire to fellowship with all the saved and especially with church members. He needs to be the focal point in every life of a church member as well. Jesus will never force himself on anyone, rather it be for salvation or a closer walk with him. He's not going to force you to do anything. He gives you that choice to decide for yourself. But any safe person, including church members, we can get caught up in the religious activities and things of this world that they can forget that we are even saved. You see, 2 Peter 1.9 tells us, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Each church member should have the desire to have a close fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a must. Verse 21 tells us, To him that overcometh, good news, to him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am sat down with my Father in his throne. Look, there is also a promise here for those who overcome all the obstacles and difficulties of Christian living. We're, we're, we're accessible to and accessible to any and everything in this world as anybody else is. But as believers, we need to exercise that faith, and, and that's what he was trying to get these people to do, to rely on him. See, they will be granted the pri privilege of sitting with Jesus on the throne of judgment during the millennial kingdom here. That's what he's promising them. We have that same promise in Matthew 19, 28, and 30. So as we read those wonderful promises, contrast them here to any situation we might enjoy on earth. Just think of the greatest thing that, that you can do here on this earth or make available to yourself here on this earth. The wealth and the grandeur of the church in Laodicea was pitiful when compared to the glory that was yet to be revealed at the coming of our Lord. We can't even imagine the glory of Christ coming here to earth to reign for a thousand years. What heaven's even going to be like for us? And here for the last time in this message, we hear that the admonition that we should awaken our understanding, get our minds in gear, and pay attention to the things Jesus said to his churches. There again, verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath to say to the churches. Look, God has given us the ability to hear and understand. He's given us the completed Word of God that we have in front of us. He has set in motion the principle that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. See, now it's up to us to use what God has given to guide our actions and shape our faith and practice. Through all these lessons, uh, these messages to these churches, and as we look back on these messages to these churches in Asia, we should, not, we should note again how truly practical and applicable these messages are to us today. Because churches, the Lord's churches today are going to find themselves in one of these seven churches. Remember, the churches are made up of individuals, people. And as we study these messages, please read them over and over again because they are a kind of a last message to the churches of Jesus for the whole church age. We will see our own soul reflected in these searching words, in all these 
messages that were given to these seven churches. Take the admonition and invitations given here personally. Look honestly at your own life. And by the grace of God, heed the invitation of the Spirit of God. And make the spiritual corrections that are needed so that Jesus can set before us the open doors of service so that we can continue to do what he wants us to do and accomplish for his churches. And the wonderful blessings of eternal reward will continue to flow into us. This is what Christ wanted for all these churches. He wanted them to act on their faith, trust in them, get correction from him, he to speaking to them. And we as believers, we should learn the vital difference between how he sees, how we see our spiritual condition and how Jesus views our life in service to him. I mean, we can go to Romans 12, 1 through 3. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must hold on to, to the word of God because it's the truth. We must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to ever have eternal life with him is through him. We must be clothed by the blood of Jesus Christ who cleanses us from all sins and makes us white as snow. It's only through Jesus Christ. These were his seven churches. He has churches today. Just remember, he was in the midst of these churches. He was giving this message to pastors to present to these churches. All these other churches were going to read all these other letters as well. So we must rely on Christ no matter our circumstances or situations. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this time that you've given us. Father, I just pray that as uh, we've looked at these uh, messages, these uh, teachings to these churches, and what Christ saw them as uh, was really re reality. Uh, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And Father, I just pray that uh, as we look into each and every one of our own lives, our own individual lives, to help us see us for who we really are and make the corrections that we need to make so that we can be better servants, witnesses, and stewards for, for you. Father, thank you once again. I pray that uh, as the Holy Spirit has spoken, that uh, you've utilized uh, uh, your instrument so that uh, it was clear and, and conveyed the message that needed to be conveyed. Help us to be that which we ought to be, giving you all the honor and glory. Watch over this church. We thank you for the memberships here. We thank you for the individuals. Continue to strengthen our pastors as we go through this, uh, this time of trial. And uh, we know that as we continue to focus on you, you will continue to hold us up, carry us through it, bring us back when your time is ready. So thank you for the messages that we've heard, the lessons that we've heard. Continue to strengthen these men as they continue to honor and glorify you to the fullest. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.